so I'll try to uh, present my idea in English. I'm from Portugal, so I had the chance to live uh, abroad for uh, some time. Um, I am a theologian by formation. Uh, recently, uh, I became very much interested in postmodern uh, thinkers and philosophers, and they had such an impact in my life that uh, what I've become and what I am um, and what I wanted as well to share with you today, this evening, uh, is part of, of my own of my own working towards something, towards probably towards something that I would call a, a global fraternity, which I would love very much uh, if it started right now where we are. Um, I've always worked with, uh, with social issues. The main focus of my own uh, daily activities these days is dialogue. So uh, dialogue, justice and world peace are the issues that really uh, make my daily routine. As it, as it was said, I, I am a co-founder of KAIS. As soon as I came back from London, I created in 2002 another association for intercultural dialogue. And right now, uh, part of this dream I have to share with you, I'm uh, trying to create with a group of other people, very passionate people, another uh, organization called the Utopia Impossible Happenings. It's still beginning, but uh, I would love it to be real as well. So, and I have a dream. <laughs> I have a dream, and the dream is not just my dream. It's the dream of so many people, children, young people, adults, the elderly. And the dream, um, which I will share with you towards the end, uh, has to do with with uh, the fact that poverty has always become for me uh, an issue that uh, uh, I, I can no longer stand. Uh, I, I, you know, to see it, uh, the fact that we have a world in which we have people that have lots of things and other people have so little, it has become an issue for me and I became so much passionate about that that I, I do, I would love to as the World Bank says, that they have a dream to, uh, and the dream they have, it's a, it's a world free of poverty. So the dream I have, it's certainly a world free of poverty, but that's not the dream I'm sharing with you today. The dream I'm sharing with you today, it's the strategy to get to the, that total sort of er eradication of poverty. But let me share you um, some of the figures when it comes to poverty. What are we talking about? Just for you to have an idea, in 2007, within the European Union, uh, we had uh, somehow 85 million people in a, in a situation of poverty. In three years, in 2010, the poor within the European Union counted already 125.3 million. So in three years, imagine how the, how, how the continent became poorer and poorer and poverty is still increasing within our own continent. And with regards to Portugal, you have figures that go from you know, 2009, in which we used to, to, to hear people saying that poverty in here would come to, or would, would have figures like 17 or 18 percent. Today, it seems that one in each four Portuguese living in Portugal, or resident in Portugal, is in a situation of poverty. So probably almost 3 million poor, uh, people in Portugal are really at the edge of being or, or living in a situation of poverty. But in the world, we have uh, almost half of the world, uh, over 3 billion people live, in less, live on less than uh, 2.50 uh, uh, US dollars a day. 80% of the humanity lives on less than uh, $10 a day. More than 80% of the world's population lives in countries where income differentials are wi widening. The poorest 40% of the world's population accounts for 5% of global income 
The richest, 20%, accounts for three quarters of world income. Other figures, and these are figures uh, from the 21st century. The wealthiest 20% of the world accounted for 76.6% of total private consumption. The poorest fifth, just 1.5. The poorest 10% accounted for just 0.5% uh, uh, and the wealthiest 10% accounted for 59% of all uh, the consumption. The world's billionaires, even less than 500 people, you know, a very uh, micro uh, percentage of the world population, were worth 3.5 trillion, over 7% of the world GDP. 1.6 billion people, a quarter of humanity, live without electricity. So 1.1 billion people in developing countries have inadequate access to water, and 2. billion lack basic sanitation. And according to UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty. And despite uh, recent in, uh, and impressive progress, mainly in China and Brazil and other countries, where poverty has really been decreasing uh, quite, quite a lot, there are still 1. billion people living in extreme poverty in the world. And most of these people are in Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, this uh, phenomenon still accounts for more than one-third of the world's extreme poor. How do people look at poverty? And what really upsets me when it comes to poverty is the tolerance and indifference, the ap apathy uh, of the majority of the people towards the phenomenon. So quite often, you, probably me, me, and all of us, we look at poverty as, as a misfortune of someone or someone's family. Sometimes we look at poverty as, or the poor as, well, you probably, it's, it's your fault. You are poor because you, you, you hate working. You are poor because you are too lazy. So it's probably your fault. And then there is this indifference. When it comes to poverty in Portugal, quite often one of the factors behind the persistence of poverty in our own country lies in the indifference of the majority of the people. We don't care. We don't really care. And if we care, the approach towards it is very much tolerating. We tolerate poverty. It comes to governments, it comes to politicians, it comes to political parties, it comes to most of the time, we tolerate the phenomenon. And in that toleration, there is, no, there is a lack of political will, there is a lack of a strong goodwill. And that's why the law, which I, I would love to share as a means to help us to eradicate or to alleviate the phenomenon, it's a very important uh, tool in, to help us in this strategy to come to levels of poverty that could be more uh, tolerated somehow. And then what happens is when this, when there is lots of indifference and tolerance, we come to the point of living to, e to each other to deal with it. So we have food banks. Today, also because of these austerity measures, we speak a lot of solidarity. But our own solidarity is a bourgeois solidarity. It doesn't go beyond the alms giving. The coins we give to someone, the food, the rice, the olive oil, the bread, you know, and then we organize three, four times in a year food banks with lots of volunteers, young people, all very enthusiastic, probably convinced, eluded with the idea that in this way we really resolve the problem or the phenomenon of poverty. But we are wrong. You know, the more almsgiving we give to those who are poor, the more we institutionalize the phenomenon, the more we leave those living in poverty in poverty. So what are the causes of poverty? And I'm not really trying to uh, figure them out all, all here, but just for you to have an idea. It's, def it's definitely a structural problem. It has to do with culture, spirituality, religion, governments. It has to do with economics, politics. It's something it is th that it is in our own structures, the structures on which we have built our own societies, in Portugal, in the world, in Europe. And then there is this stemming, it's a phenomenon stemming from unbalanced distribution of wealth. And it's laws. People are left without education and the means to be active and participatory citizens. Economic growth, this is really true about us. Economic growth benefits those who possess and control it. 
and economic growth is totally unfair to those who generate it. So, why am I bringing here the example of the abolition of slavery? Portugal is one of those countries which took the courage, you know, courageously, in 1869, dared to abolish slavery in all its territory. You know, uh, I think last year we had a movie on, on slavery in the United States. This year's movie of the year was as well a movie on slavery. With slavery and with the abolition of slavery, I, I, we are not saying that the phenomenon of slavery is totally eradicated. As Steve McQueen said the, in, in that Hollywood you know, uh, red carpet, he said that despite the abolition of slavery, he counted that in the world we still have 21 mi million people living in slavery. But, but there is something that the abolition of slavery has helped with regards to the phenomenon itself. So, but where it was abolished, slavery is dealt with as a crime. You know, slavery cannot be tolerated. The, the, the attitude of the people towards slavery is, the tot is a total intoleration towards the phenomenon. So, and the total intoleration means that slavery is not a phenomenon to be, to be, to be accepted, but a phenomenon to look at as a, as a crime, as a crime. Societies do not change by the enactment of simple decrees, we know that. We have lots of laws, and despite of the laws we have, we still live in unjust societies. We still live in unjust in societies in which there is, this in, there is a huge inequality between, between those who have and those who have not. But without the rule of law, I want to underline this, without the law or the rule of law, societies would be rather different, if not impossible. And I go back to that idea that strong will Strong, a good, strong and political will is never enough. And you may look at yourselves and we may look at, at, at things as they are in general. If, there is, if the law wasn't there behind the lack of our own good, strong will, things would be certainly different. In poverty, just for you to have an idea, have you ever, have you ever been in poverty yourselves? You probably not. And, and quite often we have people deciding to live in a situation of poverty in order to understand it and to have a stand against it. But in poverty, people have no access to appropriate feeding, housing, health, education, work, culture. People are easily excluded from the public sphere where their life is decided. They are not citizens. People are deprived of, of what is essential to one's integral development. And poverty is a total denigration of human dignity, a clear violation of fundamental rights. In Portugal, in 2008, it was declared in the Portuguese parliament that poverty could lead to the violation of, of, of fundamental rights. But here I am saying that poverty just cannot lead to, poverty is in itself a proper, a, a indeed a violation of fundamental rights. Poverty in itself is already a violation not something that can lead us or take us into that violation. Poverty is already a violation. Poverty is the mother of all, or, or the root cause of all diseases. Poverty is nevertheless tolerated, as I said, by the majority of the people. Being tolerated, poverty becomes persistent, often institutionalized. Most of our own organizations working in the field in Portugal and elsewhere, they do not eradicate or alleviate poverty. They institutionalize it. They keep, they keep the poor poor for 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Sometimes we say, as, tech, as, as social workers speaking to the poor, you know, Antonia, you've been here with me for 30 years, but imagine if I wasn't here. You know, but Antonia was someone that helped me to keep my job. And quite often within so institutions or organizations, poverty is used to keep somebody else's jobs. In the, absence, in the absence of a strong political will, so I go, I take the, the courage to, to invite law to help me in this process of eradicating the, this phenomenon, poverty, homelessness, and so on. Recourse of law. I'm a free spirit myself. I would rather live without laws, but we need laws. We go back to Hobbes. We go back to John Locke. We go back to whoever, Rousseau, 
and so many other th thinkers that helped us to understand why societies, states, need laws in order to survive or in order to be where they are not yet. So I go back to the abolition of slavery. Even though the abolition is not resolving the case of, 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 of slavery itself, at least it demands from us a total attitude, a total different attitude towards it. Um, so the introduction of law became important in the regulation of more complex human inter interactions. And poverty, I, I, I say this vehemently, and that it's something that I've been living so in, for so many years in my life, the experience of poverty in people's lives that I have no, no doubt that poverty is a crime because it violates daily fundamental rights, a right to health, a right to life, a right to housing, a right to education, a right to water, a right to be happy, if you want. And governments and the reduction of poverty rates, look at the governments, they get into government, and these days, Portugal has become poorer than what it was already in 2009 and 2010. And not just Portugal, Europe, as I said at the beginning, itself. Because of what really counts are, are, are not really the people. What really counts are, is, is the, what we call the dictatorship of members, the dictatorship of a particular economy, which is not inclusive to, of, of all, all people, but inclusive of only a, an elite, a group of uh, oligarchic people. So, but I take as well, what am I implying here? You know, Europe quite often finds countries who do not respect the, uh, certain international decisions. You know, when it comes to the carbon dioxide, I heard quite often, you know, the European Union say the countries, if they don't really help and, and work in their own places, this reduction, they will be fined. So if uh, there are international laws or regulations and decisions taken all together that, that even come to the point of fining countries because of not sticking to those decisions taken all together, why shouldn't we as well come to the point of fining governments that do not, in their own political programs, have that very clearly the reduction of poverty where we are? We are these days speaking of a slight economic growth. One point something percent. And the, the, the majority of the people in Portugal say, well, but we don't feel it. We don't feel it. Probably somebody else is feeling it. That the economy is growing. But we don't feel it in our pockets, in our tables, on our tables. We don't feel it. And my point is, if there is economic growth, and the poor, and the, and, and the people, the majority, is still poor, or keeps, they keep themselves on, in, in being poor, so that means that that economic growth is going to somebody's uh, uh, pockets, but is not reaching or coming to the pockets of everyone. So I, I think we've come to the point of being more, when it comes to the civil society, be, be more rigorous and scrutinize you know, whatever programs there are to govern you know, individually and collectively. So we need to eradicate and prevent poverty. That's, the, that's what I have. Uh, and I, I, I speak of this is the necessity of the inspection of, of cooperation, uh, of cooperation programs between countries. Countries get impoverished, losing social and economic and environmental sovereignty. Governments under normal circumstances and in times of economic growth, we ought to reduce poverty, offer uh, citizens the means to fight poverty. We are in, a, in, a, in an institute, education institute, and quite often when I speak of, of education, I speak of education in these terms. Education is, is, is the place, if you want, where we cultivate this natural tendency to cooperation. You know, we are all called to cooperate. And if schools do not help students to cultivate, to learn and cultivate that cooperation, we are not really schooling anybody. That's not education, probably. You're not educating or forming anybody. Because biology, mathemat mathematics, technologies are there to serve that process of cooperation, not the other way around. Um, education is cooperation. In the end, what, on, uh, we can still decide, and let me tell you as well this, we can still decide to be poor. We cannot really oblige someone who has decided to be poor not to be poor. But by, telling, by, by, by having someone decided to be poor, I am as well 
prohibiting that person to come to my no door and knock at my door saying, well, give me some change or help me with some food. No. If you decided to be poor, if you decided to live with what is fundamental to your own life, it's your own decision. But then you have no right to come to my door and knock at my door and ask for whatever you need. That is also clear, you know. Uh, whoever decides to be poor also decides to live up to its consequences. We tried all these already in 2011, so I'm just cutting this. These ideas, this dream I'm sharing with you has always been in my mind for some time. And with some people I've been maturing these ideas within me and within the group. And we even came to the point of creating um, a project law. But we decided then to leave that project law to political parties and to, to, to parliaments. So we stopped going there. So we decided to stick to the dream and spread it all over the world and make it contagious. And I'm here as well intending to count already on you. We need you and we need you to take this as well on board. And I believe that as it happened in the past, impossible conquests were made possible. Slavery, uh, th there were many people who, be before 1879 in, in, within Portugal, there were many people who had already dreamt of the end of slavery. And probably they never, they never came to the point of really being slaves, being free. But they dreamed of that, of that day in which slavery will be abolished. And probably it will happen to me that poverty will, will, will not be declared as I wish it to be in my own days. But uh, by dreaming of it today, it's already an achievement for me. It's already something that I treasure and something that I share with you. So be not a necessity nor a, an inevitable fate. In fact, Nelson Mandela, uh, with regards to poverty, he used to say quite often, Poverty is, an, is, a, is a human construction. It's a human creation. It, it is not an inevitable thing. It is not a fate. And it is in our power to reduce poverty or to reduce, it, to, to reduce it to mere traces of it. Because I'm not naive as well. You know, Jesus Christ in the scriptures said once that the poor will always be with you. But I'm trying somehow to, to go beyond this Jesus saying. Even though poverty will always be there with us, what I want when it comes to poverty is just to see traces of it. Just to see traces of it. And that is, is, is it's in our power. So, coming to the end, I don't know the time, but probably the time's already. So, I dream. That's the dream. I have a dream, just like this child living in poverty. I have a dream. The dream I have is that all nations one day will solemnly declare poverty is illegal. That's my dream, that one day poverty will be declared, who knows, beginning with Portugal as an example to the nations in the world, that poverty is illegal. By being legal, it is criminalized. We shall be looking at poverty with different eyes. And whenever we find poverty emerging, arising, we will be going there with a different attitude, with a totally different attitude, which is, which is totally different from the attitude we have these days. Um, poverty illegal in blue, a global movement for which to live and fight for. Make this your personal cause in this third millennium. And this is a working construction. So that's the utopia, impossible happenings. And uh, if you want, you can always start starting right now to contact us through impossible happenings at gmail.com. So uh, as a summary, um, I would say poverty violates fundamental rights. As, as a violation of fundamental rights, poverty is a crime. And looking at the example of the abolition of slavery, I take as well the force of law to help us our will, where our will by itself it does not go. So I, I, I ask the support of law to help us as well to come to the point of, of eradicating poverty or surely alleviating it by declaring it illegal. And I would love Portugal to, 
to be uh, the first country in the world to come to the Sonnenland Declaration within its Portuguese parliament. Thank you.